Paul and good morning. It's fabulous to be here with you in Las Vegas at Essentials. And indeed, Las Vegas is a long journey for me, both geographically and metaphorically. It's kind of a hard place to describe, isn't it, to people who haven't been here before? In fact, the best I've heard is, Las Vegas is what would happen if you gave a 12-year-old a trillion dollars to redecorate his bedroom. <laughs> so, the power of words. We've all had communication triumphs. Maybe it was a witty one-liner at the drinks on Tuesday night. Maybe it's that fabulous trauma team you ran beautifully, succinctly with your communication. Or maybe it's that short, sharp referral to your cardiology consultant. But we've all had communication disasters as well. A couple of my personal experiences, asking that middle-aged male patient of yours if the young lady down here, his daughter, could like to stay in the room, only to be told it's his wife. And uh, another personal favourite is uh, standing there, and admittedly this was fairly late in a shift, and saying a very thorough history with my elderly patient with dementia. So how long have you had memory problems? Yes, indeed, we've had triumphs and disasters. We've also had experiences where maybe we shouldn't have said anything at all. Like that time when that borderline personality disordered patient finally gets the better of you, pushes that button, and you swear at them and call them an asshole. You just should have stopped. And in fact, I've heard this said a couple of different ways. We have two ears and one mouth. We should keep it in that ratio. Or, another way of putting it, there's a reason our mouth can shut and our ears can't. Listening may just be the most powerful words we ever do. So choosing the right words at the right time is a challenge for all of us, personally and professionally, of course. And so today we're going to talk about three issues that I think maybe might help us improve the power of our words. The first is to recognise that the words are only as powerful as us tailoring them to our audience. And in fact, our audience is broader than we might think. The second thing is to recognise that our words are only as good as the voice and the body language that we use to convey them. And finally, we're going to think about a very specific form of powerful words, and that is giving feedback. So let's think about this audience issue. And I guess to start this off, I'm going to ask you to engage in a little bit of an activity for me. And I want you all to imagine that you're at a job interview. It's a job you really want. It pays much better than the one you've got right now. And sitting across the table from you are your interviewers. And they say to you, so tell us three words to describe yourself. So I want you all to take just 10 or 15 seconds and think, what are those three words you'd use to describe yourself in the job interview? Now, to keep you honest, I'm going to ask you to turn to the person next to you, and if you haven't already, introduce yourself, and share those three words that you would use to describe yourself. I'm going to give you 20 seconds. Lights up so I can make sure that we can see everyone is sharing. Okay, that's enough time. You've got your three words. Okay, so now... Now I want you to think about a different situation. You're having your perfect date. And now this might be your current partner for some of you, but this is someone you want to impress romantically. You're out to dinner and your perfect date leans across the table holding their glass of wine, and says to you, tell me three words to describe yourself. And I want you to think of those three words, and I'm going to give you another 20 seconds to share them with the person next to you. OK, so. Now, 
I don't need to know what those three words were in either situation. But suffice to say, if they were the same three words in the job interview as they were on the date, you are very sad. <laughs> and I can tell you right now, you are going to get neither the job nor the girl. So simplistic, maybe. But this illustrates that, of course, we're going to tailor our words to the audience we have. And this applies to us in many different situations. Of course, it applies to me now. What do I think about this audience, and how have I tailored my communication? Well, I knew the audience would be big, so I'm going to need a microphone. I knew the audience would be expectant, because they've had two whole days of fabulous talks at Essentials. I knew the audience would be medical, and so I could rely on some shared experience. Although, there was something Paul didn't tell me about you, and that was just how good-looking you are. But then let's think about our audiences at work. Let's think about the trauma team, and clearly our communication is tailored for that. It's short, it's sharp, it's punchy. We directive, our body language is domineering, and our voice is loud and clear. But have we ever stopped to think about our trauma team or our code team as our audience? Have we actually stopped to ask them what do they think of our communication and to give us some feedback on that? Because for all of us, there is a different amount of journey between that style of communication and our natural one. Obviously, at work, the other big audience we have are our patients, and we've heard plenty of advice here and elsewhere about how to connect with them. And clearly, we have a different approach. We're that sort of crazy, funky ER doc when we've got the three-year-old with something stuck up their nose. We've clearly got a much more serious ER doc when we're talking to our 75-year-old retired accountant. And then, of course, we've got our very tough ER doc when we're trying to take down that ice addict in front of us. Of course, we tailor it to our audience. But the other audience that I wanted us to think about today is a very important one, and that is those folks, our inpatient teams, our consultants, as you would call them, the people that we are asking to continue the care of our patients. Because here is some of the finely nuanced communication that we see, and not all of it good. We've heard this term, buffing, turfing, selling, marketing, somehow getting rid of our patients, talking about them as commodities. And when we talk to those people we're referring to, we've had a lot of tips. Dr. Slovis gave us some excellent ones yesterday. But I would suggest to you that often what we're using in that conversation is a language of power. If you don't admit this patient, then they will sue me, die, have some adverse effect. If you don't admit that patient, I'll have to talk to your boss. And other forms of words which, let's face it, we've all got pretty good at over the years. And you know what? They work. They certainly work in the short term. But I'd like us to take a moment to consider that maybe we're doing some harm if we persist with the language of power and build up an environment of conflict with those that we work with every day. And what I'm going to suggest is a conceptual shift. It's harder to do than just the everyday. But to shift from a language of power to a language of connection. What does that look like? Well, for me, it looks something like gaining rapport, doing the things that we normally do when we try and connect with someone. Hello, my name is Victoria. Have we worked together before? Where are you from? What have you been doing there? If we're going to give our patients 60 seconds, surely we can give our colleagues 30. And already I can hear you all saying, that won't work in my shop. It's a nightmare in there. Well, it is a nightmare for everybody. But we all have to start somewhere. And we know we can't necessarily make that language of connection work the first time at 3 o'clock in the morning with a big argument. But what I'd suggest is every day we can look for that language of connection. And maybe we can help that by things like shared education, things like shared research, th shared administrative tasks, where we can build a new team around the patient journey, not just the tribes that we individually attach to. So let's put aside this for a minute. Clearly, we're going to tailor our words to our audience. But let's think about the next thing. The fact that words are only as powerful as the voice and the body language that we use them with. I'm going to tell you a very sobering fact. For any audience, what we say, our verbal content, is only about 7% of our impact. How we say it, our vocal variety, our pitch, our pace, our volume, is about 38% of our impact, which leaves 
55% of our impact is in our body language. Which is why politicians wave and smile when they're telling you the deficit has just reached $2.3 trillion, because they know that when you watch the news, all you remember are the pictures, not what people said. This is demonstrated over and over again. It's also why I'm wearing really nice shoes right now. So yes, voice and body language, they're incredibly important. Voice of, is hard to do, but I think maybe John Wayne said it best. Talk low, talk slow, and don't say too much. But body language is really where the money is, as they say. So I think this brings us to the next point, that every day when we walk into work, we are being judged. We are performing to our audience. We might not like that, but it's a reality. People are going to look at us and what my grandmother called poise, they're going to judge us on. So with that in mind, maybe we need to do a little practice on how to walk in and perform every day. So I'm going to need the lights up and I'm going to need you to all stand up. Oh, I know it's hard work at this hour of the day. OK, so this is a little something I learnt at a place called NIDA, which in Australia is the National Institute of Dramatic Art. It's where Kate Blanchett trained. It's where all the famous Australian actors trained. And I went there trying to learn a little bit about how to be a better performer. And of course, they're full of all their alumni being so famous. And they said, this is how Kate Blanchett prepares to go on stage. So what we're all going to do is do a little warm up. And first, you need to get your feet just underneath your hips, not too far apart. We don't want any Prince of Wales. We don't want any crazy stuff. Just kind of nice. Then we're going to do a little shoulder roll backwards. That's good, isn't it? Just relaxing. And then we're going to go down a little bit. Yep, good. And then just knees loosen up. OK. Now, here's the bit that Kate does. It's a three-step process. The first thing she does, I don't know if you can see yours, but just down to my left is my crown, and I'm going to put it on. So pick up your crown and put it on your head. That's good. That's good. And already, I can see that you've all just lifted your chin just one or two centimeters. You're looking good. OK, the next thing Kate does is she grabs her cape and puts it round her shoulders. So grab yours, put it round your shoulders. Good, now we've got our shoulders back, we've got our chin up. Now the last thing Kate does, I don't know if you've got one, but I have, is this little switch down on her right hip. And when she turns it on, it's her chest light. And then light just emanate, emanates up from her chest. So turn on your chest light as well. Man, you're looking good. Give yourselves a round of applause and sit down. And I think if you do that every day when you go into work, you will feel good, and your audiences will love you. OK, so having known it's about the audience, having thought hard about how we're going to use our voice and our body language, I want us just to think for a moment about another situation, a specific one of giving feedback. Because if all words are powerful, then feedback words really are a double or nothing. And we've all given and received pointless positive feedback. Good job, as you would say here. Lovely working with you, as we might say at home. And often we say that when there actually has been an important issue to address. We've also all received and probably given meaningless negative feedback that's been unhelpful. You were terrible. I guess you've just got to be more confident. It'll come with time. Not very helpful. Is there another way? Because we need to be having feedback conversations, and not just with our trainees, but with each other. Because in fact, this is the way that we can improve our performance, our team performance, and ultimately our patient care. So we've got to be prepared to have conversations about our performance. So here's a little example I might share with you. Let's imagine you've been involved in a resuscitation team, and you've had another role, but your colleague has done the airway, and it's been terrible. It took eight or nine minutes to get the tube in. They desaturated. Patient's all right, but it really wasn't pretty. Now, I guess you could just ignore it or say something like, so, tough tube, hey? Not very helpful. You could get really judgmental and say, I think you need to be faster next time. Also not that helpful. I'm going to suggest that maybe the thing that we need to look for is a stance of genuine curiosity. Because the trouble with both of those things is they make assumptions about our performance. Whereas perhaps 
we need to find out what is the basis that underpinned that performance. So here's an example. I saw it took you nine minutes to get that tube in after we gave the paralytic agents. I'm concerned because the patient could have become very hypoxic had we not done some excellent apneic oxygenation. I'm curious as to what happened there. And you have to be truly curious because, in fact, you might get a range of different answers. It might be, yeah, it was technically really hard. They had a terrible snaggle tooth, and I just don't know how to deal with that. That's one conversation. It might be, I knew I had to get the tube in, but I just couldn't organise the nurses to get me the equipment at the right time. I didn't know who was doing what. That's a different conversation. Or they might say something like, yeah, SATs of 84, that's OK, isn't it? Different conversation again. So it's worth getting good at giving and receiving feedback. We've just scratched the surface here. But I guess to really make this point, I can't just, you know, I have to walk the walk here, don't I? I can't just be all talk. So perhaps I need to get a bit of feedback on my talk here today. I know you'll probably all fill out your evaluations, but I want some immediate, specific, rigorous feedback from someone who's prepared to lay it all on the line. I wonder who could do that for me. I guess I'll just have to give myself some feedback. So we're going to imagine here that uh, Dr. Brazel, who's just given you the talk, and here we have Vic, who's going to be given the feedback. Let's see how we go. So, Dr. Brazel, thanks so much for uh, coming and giving the talk at Essentials. Have you been having a good time here? Uh, yeah, no worries, Vic. Uh, I have been having a good time. Actually, Vegas is interesting, and uh, I do like the way you're building rapport before we get down to business. Okay, well, we will get down to business, Dr. Brazel. Um, how do you think you went? Well, Vic, I don't know, maybe I'd give myself a 7.5 out of 10. Probably went the way I thought. Would have liked the feedback thing to be a little bit longer. But look, to be honest, it probably, I didn't trip up the stage. There are a few things I did OK. I'm not sure that that's a very high bar, not tripping up the stage. Look, there were two things I liked. One was that you didn't use any slides. I thought that was frankly a bit brave. Um, and the second thing, I think this concept about everyone at work being our audience was pretty new to me. Well, as for using no slides, I guess you've got to think of Malcolm McClure, don't you? The medium is the message. You can hardly give a talk about the power of words and have a whole bunch of images that you're showing. Um, but I'm glad you like the idea about the audience. It hadn't really occurred to me until I started giving a lot of talks and thinking about performing, and I thought, you know what? This is just as applicable in my clinical world as it is in my speaking world, and maybe I need to change some of my behaviour. And the thing that I would say about that is, it's a journey for all of us, and when we're on our game, it's easy. But when we're tired, hungry, unhappy, we revert to our own communication styles, and we start forgetting about the audience. Hmm, interesting thought. Well, any thoughts for improvement for next time, and where to from here? Well, there's no doubt we could always improve. I guess I'll get a little bit of feedback from the guys backstage as well. But uh, I think next time I wish I'd had a haircut just a few days before. My hair was a little bit long. Uh, but I think seriously, I think I'd like to do that feedback session in a little bit more detail because I think you need more examples to really give that to the audience. Well, thanks again, Dr. Brazel. It's been a pleasure to have you here. And uh, maybe we'll have essentials in Australia one day. Thanks very much. So, the power of words. Let's all just remember, it is about our audience, not us. Let's make sure we're using our voice and our body language to convey the messages that we want to convey. And finally, let's all just take a moment and think about how we can give and receive feedback, take that opportunity, and do it as well as we can. Thank you very much. Thank you.